Hi, my name is Bob. I run a company called Pet Air. Our website is www.petairuk.com. Before the pet passport scheme started, which was when I'd first become a vet, which was in about 1998, the pet passport scheme had just started then. They'd, we didn't have the pet passport booklets. They were just individual bits of paper, really. The pets going out would have to return to the UK and serve six months quarantine. There was no way around it. They couldn't go to Europe. They couldn't go to rabies-free countries like Australia and New Zealand. They had to come back in and do six months quarantine. So obviously people were very reluctant to take their pets abroad because there was no reasonable way of getting the pets back in. The pet passport scheme started when rabies became less common worldwide and essentially meant that the pets in the UK could be vaccinated against rabies, which would stop them getting rabies, and then they could go abroad, not get rabies because they were vaccinated, and then they could return to the UK. When the pet passport scheme first started, and up until fairly recently, you had to do a rabies blood sample at least six months before the flight to prove that the rabies vaccination had worked. In January the 1st, 2012, the UK had to fall into line with the rest of the EU so that this six-month blood sample is now no longer required. So you can prepare your pet to travel back into the UK from many, many places in just 21 days, which has obviously helped the movement of pets massively. There is a question mark as to whether it makes the UK more susceptible to getting a case of rabies over here, but rabies worldwide and in Europe is actually pretty rare now and it's only really illegally imported dogs into Europe who have brought cases of rabies in. Dogs travel generally more nicely than we expect them. They snuggle up in their crates, they're safe and as soon as they see their owner the other end, they are just happy to see their owner and they forget about what has happened previously. They did a big study in the States about dogs and what they do while they fly. 75% of the time the dogs in the study laid down and they tended only to get upset during takeoff and landing. The background noise, which is the same as we get, there's not many sudden bangs, sudden noises. It is much more of a background drone. So it's not like a dog who gets scared on fireworks night or with loud noises. And as I said, they cope much more nicely than we expect them to. The old ones, the young ones, the not so fit ones, they travel nicely. The cost of flying your dog varies enormously depending on the size of your dog and where you're going. The airline charges are the expensive bit and they're based on the volume of the crate that your dog flies in, not the actual weight, the volume. And so if you have a Chihuahua who's flying to Spain, it's probably going to be about six, seven hundred pounds. If you've got a Great Dane flying to Australia, by the time you pay for quarantine, flights, blood work, it may be five or six thousand pounds. So it is one of those things. You're very welcome to call us for free. We'll tell you how much approximately will be. Or if you are definitely going, then we can give you an accurate price very easily. Once your pet's flight is booked, there's many different options that your pet shipper can offer you. For example, at Pet Air, Either we can collect your pet the day before the flight, do the vet work and take your pet into check-in or if you would prefer we can meet you at the airport with the airline docks, we will give you a list of documents to bring and then we will take your pet round and check them in. All pets now have to be x-rayed the same as our baggage does, it's completely non-harmful to the pets, it's obviously to keep everything as secure and as safe as possible. After we've checked your pet in, most airlines have a separate quarantine room where the pets can be away from the hubbub of the main warehouse. They will then wait there while the airlines complete the paperwork. Around an hour, an hour and a half before the flight leaves, your dog will be taken out to the airplane, loaded on the airplane, 
securely strapped down. They will make sure that the heating in the hold works so that your dog can stay nice and warm during the flight. And then the door closes and away they go. At the other end, they are taken off the airplane, generally into air-conditioned vehicles, into the air-conditioned warehouses, where they will wait for the owners to go through the process of customs clearing them and for the local authority vets to clear the pets for entry into the country where they're going to. At that point, you would pick up your pets and take them home. Some places, mainly Australia and New Zealand, do have quarantine on landing, so the quarantine staff will pick the pets up from the airport. Your pets will serve quarantine, and then you will pick them up after their stay in quarantine. For Australia, the quarantine is a minimum of 30 days. For New Zealand, it's 10 days. And that's probably the only places that need quarantine. The UK benefits massively from being rabies-free and exotic disease-free, which means that many places are happy to have our pets land and come straight home. On the day of the flight, the pets are checked in four hours before the flight. Airlines are only allowed to fly pets if they have special animal trained staff at their ports of departure and destination. The dogs themselves are often not handled directly. They will stay in their crates where it's safe and snug and they are secure. Once you get the dogs out of their crates, they think their journey is done. So they don't want to go back in. So the dogs will stay in their crates and then the crate and the dog, they will then be moved from the warehouse at point of check-in out to the airplane and loaded up on the airplane. When your dog flies, sedation is absolutely banned. We have to sign a declaration at the airport to confirm that the dog has not been sedated in any way, shape or form. They did a study in the States about pets flying and sedation and it was found that the, the sedative in combined with the air pressure changes was actually detrimental to your dog's health and a greater number of sedated dogs died compared to unsedated dogs. So it is completely fully banned. That really applies to medical veterinary grade sedative drugs. Things like rescue remedy we use, things like the pheromones we use, some people use skullcap and valerian, some people use xylokine, all pretty nicely. If it helps their pets, then they definitely can be used. The whole process of flying your dog is hugely safe. Snub-nosed dogs, bulldogs, pugs, they do have a statistically higher chance of dying on a flight because their airways do not allow them to expel heat as efficiently as a dog with a normal nose. The risk is still tiny. I mean, we're talking about one in 10,000. And so it's not a common thing at all. The problem is that the bad stories make headlines, which is why if you look on the internet, you'll find as many stories about problems as you will about journeys that have gone nicely because the journeys that have gone nicely just don't make good news. Since 2004 when Pet Air UK started we have probably flown in the order of 10,000 pets. That includes diabetic pets, epileptic pets, dogs with heart murmurs. We flew a 23 year old cat to Australia and we have never had a pet die. We have had, by recollection, only two incidents of pets having to go directly to the vets after they've landed, and both of those pets were particularly old pets going to very hot destinations. Both those pets were fine after they had had the medical treatment, and so obviously you're gonna worry about flying your pet because they're your dog, and that's completely normal. But statistically, the chances of problems are incredibly small.